Hey there, this is Dan, you're watching The Salty Sea, and today I have a very special video that's been requested a few times, and to record it, I wanted to bring on someone who has shown a lot of new players the game, who has also proven himself to be, and uh, I'm quoting from another Madisonian here, one of the best players in the Madison suburbs. Uh, this is Dogs <laughs> of War Cries, Eric. How you doing, Eric? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to talking to you about new player tactics. This is absolutely something that I'm, I'm passionate about, helping new players uh, get their footing in this game, which isn't too hard, thankfully, because it's a well a well done game. But yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. And for the viewers, I just want to let people know this video is going to be not necessarily sort of the most advanced you know, gameplay there is, although Eric did recently win a tournament where he uh, drove up to Minnesota, but it will be sort of aiming to bring people from, hey, I've played two games, three games, to getting to where you kind of feel like you know where you're going in that. And uh, one of the things that I think I've noticed the most with new players, a lot of kind of mistakes around objective play and valuing sort of who should be on what objectives, etc. You know, I've even had someone sort of not put all their fighters on objectives or just leave objectives without going to other ones, which is um, certainly something you want to want to avoid. But Eric, I was hoping we could kind of talk about some of the basics for how to play on these objective missions and um, sort of go through it there. Uh, before we kind of before I try to bring any kind of framework to it, are there any kind of specific mistakes you've seen? people make on objectives, things like that? I think, um, you know, one of the things in playing a game like Warcry in general, where you can measure any time, uh, you know, get out your ruler or your um, measuring tape and just kind of see where things are in relationship to each other. Mm -hmm. Objective play is one of those places to very, like, use your measuring tape often to see how close you are, like, especially from deployment to your, to where objectives are or, mm -hmm you know, and, and, and speak with your opponent and, and confirm, hey, this looks like I'm this many inches away. So if I've got a movement of four, uh, you know, it's a seven inches away, I have a movement of four, that should put me, does that put me within three inches of that objective, um, uh, et cetera, and sort of talk it out yeah. uh, and, and to help, uh, because it's one of those things where tables get bumped a lot, right? terrain moves around a little bit mm -hmm. and so i i always find it helpful to be very transparent about my movement and what's in range of what uh, so that's one thing uh that, that i could recommend and that especially comes in in round one like i've seen players um use rush to run a fighter to an objective and just stand right there on the center of it and then mm -hmm. uh not have rush for their next fighter who is actually further back in their deployment and now that fighter actually can't even get to the objective whereas they would have they would have gotten both of the fighters counting on the objective if they had used rush on the second one something like that and that's where mm -hmm. um, measuring can really really help there just to know know those distances yeah, um, yeah and 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 I think there's a little bit of, and I, I'm thinking about it, um, you know, often you just want to have a toe in. Mm -hmm. um, being, uh, sometimes it may be important to be uh, like fully within or on the objective, but rarely because of the objective. It may be more about wanting to be close to something else or some other fighter or something like that. So for the objective, just having an edge of your base within that three inches is often just enough. Uh, uh, and then on the on the flip, um, knowing when you're like <laughs> when the edge of if you've got models on there and you you know a fighter's coming towards you, can you keep them outside of that uh, three inch uh, mm -hmm. range? So I think that that edge, that rim of that of the objective perimeter, is where most of the action, uh, uh, where most of the movement uh, should probably be. Absolutely. And sometimes objectives are sort of close enough together where, you know, in like say seven inches apart, where a base that is bigger than an inch, which is at least half the bases in the game, 
really, mm -hmm. um, yeah. can count for both. And I've definitely seen new folks get a little bit uh, peeved the first time that happens to them, or maybe not peeved, but like, it's not obvious the first time you play the game, I would say, that that is yeah, you know, yeah. something that you should be doing. Um, and yeah. I, another, another thing to say yeah. there, and, and, and kind of especially when you're playing your first games, that transparency, but um, it's more important to learn the rules than to win the game mm -hmm. uh, as you're starting out. And so if you're playing with somebody else, you might be able to like, you know, be quiet on, hey, you know, you see that they're maybe straddled one way more than the other. And you're like, I gotcha. Um, yeah. But at the beginning, it's more important to maybe like talk through that and say, hey, you know what, if you can do this, uh, if you move it like this, you can hit both of them and, and kind of talk through it and make sure you both understand what those rules are, how it can be affected, you know, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to beat your friend in the first game, you probably could be missing some <laughs> really helpful learning lessons. Right. Um, and I wanted to return to something you said that the edges is where the action is, um, because I think that's really true, especially for that positioning where you said, you know, sometimes you want to just come up to the very edge of it. Sometimes you want to go all the way to the opposite edge to kind of force your opponent out. I think as a really good guideline for newer players, usually your, you know, biggest, chonkiest bully piece should be really excited to run up to that front edge of that objective um, and say, you have to get through me to, to get onto this thing. Um, I think that that's a good heuristic for newer players to, to get into. Um, though, you know, you'll have to contend with your opponent doing similar things as well. Uh, another thing I've noticed is I think of, I think of a lot of objective play as sort of a resource game where you only have so many sort of like think of it like Moncala, right? You only have so many uh, little beads to put in each cup, and it's really inefficient for you if you end up, you know, winning one cup by four beads and losing three cups. Maybe this is more like a gerrymandering, actually. <laughs> <laughs> if you win one cup by, or if you win one district by, you know, yeah. thousands and thousands of votes, and you lose three districts by hundreds of votes you've lost, um, even if you have more uh, more fighters on your team. So um, I think it's... Or to, to, oh, yeah. to muddy the water more, <laughs> uh, what if you buy a, a burger uh, for in, with cash, but they don't have change and all you have is a five on you? Uh, you know, you spent overpaid for the burger, right? right? Uh, yeah. and, uh, and you can't get your money back. So like... Yeah, there's there's a there are many situations where you're hoping that your opponent is spending more resources than they're getting value out of, mm -hmm. uh, and then the vice versa for yourself. Can you be efficient uh, in in how you use your um, your resources to maximize the impact on the game? Yeah, and then where the thing you said about sort of try to learn the rules first in your first few games over winning. Um, one of the places where the rules kind of teaches you how to use your resources most effectively is in uh, things like objectives can be empty when and still count for you because they have to be taken from you to uh, to act for you to actually lose them. And so if you take a fighter off of an objective and run them to another objective um, and leave that objective empty and score it, it's essentially like your fighter is counting for two because they're essentially still counting on that old objective and they're counting on a new one, um, which I think yeah. becomes one of the most powerful things that you can do in objective missions is to kind of do a shuffle. Even in, even some recent, um, I think maybe even at, at uh, your event, where there's objectives where they don't score until the end of the game maybe, mm -hmm. um, it's still important to grab those objectives and count them. You know, they, you score them at the end of the battle round or gain control of them at the end of a battle round. So even if you're not scoring until turn five, um, you can claim them turn one and you're automatically getting a plus one uh, to that objective when you are contesting it later in every each you know round. And so by just claiming it for one round, um, 
It just means it's easier to hold it when it comes to that last round if you've, mm-hmm. if you've been controlling it throughout. Yeah, So absolutely. grab them. Like any chance mm-hmm. you get, grab them and then <laughs> position yourself to bounce to the next one. Yeah. And think of it as like a little investment. I played against someone who um, didn't come onto an objective that I had a fomeroid crusher on because they didn't want me to be able to be in combat with them and count. And so they essentially gave me the point that round in hopes that they would then be able to mob it in a future round with like sort of out activating me. But then they ended up only tying it on that future round and they essentially lost because they hadn't, you know, kept it in the air Mm -hmm. later. Um, And so you're, you're often it can be really hard to come back subtly in objective missions um, because sometimes you can actually start turning the resources advantage around on your opponent and still not necessarily turn the points your way if they're winning all the ties because they had won the objectives early. And so, yeah, that's absolutely something to to think Uh, about and prioritize. And and just maybe a Captain Obvious thing, if uh, you have a token pack... Um, and they have these little tiniest tokens that have like one, two, three, four, five, uh, red and blue. Those are great for putting down and showing, hey, this one is either red or blue's objective uh, who has uh, control over it. That's so funny. I only ever use those tokens to do either my deployment point or um, like to mark a fighter as having gotten a buff. Is that what they're supposed to be That's, for? Uh, I don't know if they're supposed to. They don't really... Ex- do they explain them? I should get out my book. I've uh, never seen them. But that's explained. what I've used them for because there's uh, there's numbers on them. So you yeah. can kind of do, you know, objective one, two, three, four, five kind mm-hmm. of thing. Sometimes <laughs> okay. I think they were initially meant for uh, if you have multiple fighters of the same type that you could put a token by each of them for one, two, three, four, five potentially. Oh, sure. To then track on those abomination little cards they give you i'm holding one up to the <laughs> yep. camera right now so the people at home can see but those cards do not try i wish i'd put that here uh for a new it's not actually tactical but do not use those off board cards to track your wounds i've literally never seen someone keep them straight if they're trying to use the off board cards uh separate separate rant yeah. i'll save that for a different video um <laughs> yeah I <laughs> um, I think we covered a lot of the sort of early things that aren't obvious. Can you think of anything else that you've seen as like a quick mistake that a lot of people make in their first four or five games in uh, in these types of missions? Yeah, I think um, uh, just, I mean, here's one of those things that we talk about um, often. Warcry is, has a high value for movement. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this is a place where um, fast units have give you some flexibility mm-hmm. um, in being able to get places when you need them to. So if you know they're over capturing an objective and you want to, what you said, mob another objective toward the end, <laughs> you know those fast moving units can give you that ability to get to whichever objective in the last round mm-hmm. needs to to you need to flip it. So that's really great. Um, and slow moving stuff. Um, is sort of nice for not dying in the first <laughs> rounds right. uh, because they haven't gotten there yet. Um, they're not in the fray. And so um, that both movement can work both ways uh, to your benefit, both fast and slow. So um, don't get discouraged by uh, certain, you know, you use the different speeds for, to your advantage, but also your, if somebody has movement five, you don't have to use all that movement either. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think that, that with objective play, it can it can get uh, um, it can make you antsy to get places quick and ex- overextend yourself, mm-hmm. uh, but you may not have to. And with those fast fighters, sometimes you you really want to just be painting the edges of those objectives against a slow warband because they will attrition you out if you start fighting them over them. But if you, if you do just paint the edges and stay out of the fights, um, you can sometimes have then the opportunity to sort of leave an objective to then just have more of your 
um, more of your fighters in the right places than your opponent, but you just really have to stay alive, um, which okay. sort of we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those sorts of themes later because, um, you know, the we're talking about sort of fighters as number pieces, but to kind of move on, the opposite thing that fighters do other than just count for points is uh, actually fight each other, um, which is <laughs> <laughs> one of one of the other biggest things that I see people kind of mess up with. Um, so different fighters, uh, and this, this sounds kind of uh, simplistic, but maybe I'll call this video tactics for dummies. Uh, different fighters <laughs> want to be fighting different things. Yeah. And so uh, the sort of biggest example I can think of, um, I'm, I play chaos and order mostly. So uh, the the chaos sort of choice you always have when you're list building is sort of Varengard or FOMO Crusher in my mind um, because they cost a similar amount of points and they do completely different things. Um, and so if I can throw some math at people and uh, I'll apologize for it after I'm done, um, a Varengard with the blade, when it's using Relentless Killers, uh, is 81% likely to one-shot kill a Toughness 4 12-wound fighter, which is a lot of dwarves. Um, it's also extremely good at killing 10-wound uh, fighters. Um, it's just incredible at killing small fighters. Uh, but that re like drops down quite a bit later. Um, and the FOMO Crusher, using Onslaught, which is only giving it plus one attack, uh, is only 72% chance and has a way less range. It's just much, much worse at hunting small little chaff models. Um, but if a Varengard and a FOMO Crusher fight, the FOMO Crusher will win four out of five times. And the Varengard costs more points. Um, so you will be really disappointed if your Varengard uh, fights a FOMO Crusher. And uh, moments after this picture was taken, uh, if you can believe it, that Varengard ran straight at that FOMO Crusher and attacked it with Relentless Killers. Um, and uh, let's just say the next round it was not on the board. Um, yeah, yeah, it's... And, and some of, of, you know, we talked a little bit about list building, but yeah, knowing whether or not a model is um, there to take out what, the term chaff, mm -hmm. um, small little things and just kind of uh, deplete the, you know, clear the board, take away resources, take away activations from your opponent, or as a deterrent to a part of the board, um, to, to keep the Varengard away, right? A FOMO Crusher mm -hmm. might be able to go over and punch a Varengard, but maybe be there to just keep the Varengard in check, right? Right. Um, uh, or, uh, you know, I, something that's there to just, there's some fighty stuff that's just better at, you know, T3, T4 stuff. And pr yeah, yeah, I think you, mm -hmm. the Varengard is one of those where they're going to clear the middle of the board or the mid-ranged fighters all day long. Um, but yep. maybe not go up against the the biggest of the biggest. Yeah, Varengard are actually incredible at like hunting down the support hero who is giving out the crazy good abilities that are um, sort of the backbone of someone's warband, something like that. Uh, yep. But they are so bad at fighting the thing that is receiving those abilities, um, <laughs> and and so that is a thing where uh, you know you mentioned list building. Uh, that's a thing to keep in mind after you've built your list, but it's also a thing to think about as you're building your list. And um, this sort of wasn't something I was going to get into, but thinking about which type of threat your list wants is, I think, a really interesting exercise. Um, in the previous slide, this is my Nurgle Warband that this picture is of, and I chose a Varen Guard. That's my sort of... Um, Varen, yeah. Varen Elk, but uh, <laughs> I love the Varen Guard because Plague Bearers are so darn slow, and so you need that fast threat, and Plague Bearers are also incredibly good at avoiding dying from other big things, and so 
the idea is if the Varengard's running around killing their little things and my little things are dying much more slowly than my opponents because their big things can't kill my little things, if I can get that recipe to work, it's going to work in my favor really nicely. Um, it doesn't work every time, but that is kind of a, a way to think about sort of a plan with what big thing to choose. Whereas I think a lot of other war bands, um, you know, I play Zinch Arcanites sometimes. They're not one of the stronger factions in the game, but they're much more interested in a FOMO Crusher than a Varengard because they're all running around at move five, right? That's that's great. Um, but they, yeah. you know, they don't just win their 1v1 fights ever. Um, and yeah. Fomeroid Crushers are great at winning 1v1 fights. And so... Um, that guy is much better in Zinch than uh, than the Varengard would be, even though you know I've found the opposite to be true in my Nurgle lists. Um, yeah. Well, I, I like your second point here. Some traff are great at, at running, and some traff uh, are great at fighting. I think if um, the the flip of if you can be strategic about your target priority, knowing mm -hmm. what type of fighter your fighters are good at getting engaged with and attacking. Mm -hmm. The reverse is if you can gum up your opponent by feeding him the, the incorrect matchups. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, you you know, sometimes, uh, you know, that Varengard who's great at medium chaff, like, yeah, they'll they're, they'll clear a skeleton or, a, or something even smaller, but that's a, a wasted activation, mm. maybe, right? It's a mm -hmm. wasted, the FOMO Crusher to, to have to roll dice throw dice into um, a rat uh, or a goblin, like that's a waste of, of their potential. Yeah. Uh, and so when we talk about, you know, efficiency, if you can create the, the force, the target priority for them mm -hmm. rather than giving them for free reign to uh, <clears throat> approach or to choose the matchups uh, that can be really good for you. Yeah. And then, I really like that, like feeding something a single skeleton, and then it's like, mm -hmm. congratulations, you did 20 damage to this <laughs> once 40-point skeleton. Um, uh -huh. The other thing I like thinking about is, um, like, Grave Guard and Plague Bearers as my example of chaff, where I'm actually really excited to have someone walk up to a cloud of Plague Bearers and try to kill one because there's a really good chance it'll fail, and now all those Plague Bearers get to attack it, and uh, at four damage for every time you roll a six, and they're, each of them rolls three dice, and, you know, you can take some big things down with three or four Plague Bearers, um, and Grave Guard are the yep. even scarier version of that, where uh, you run into three Grave Guard, you won't be running out, even if, you know, your fighter can often cost a lot more than those three grave guard do um they also are really good at bullying other chaff um you know just winning the 1v1 fight against other chaff whereas ghouls ghouls are still amazing right um 55 points move five they can go all around the board like what we said on the objective game before like they they fly around the board going from going to whichever objective they want. They let you sort of place all your pieces and score all your points really optimally. Um, but they really don't want to be fighting. And and ghouls are really good because they've got the reaction um, baffling parlay, I think is what it's called. But it's it gives minus one attack, um, which is mm. really amazing. Mm. But, you know, for their points, they're not good at fighting back. And... Uh, they're not good at fighting other chaff because minus one attack from a plague bearers, you know, uh, from a plague bearers attack is like not really worth a uh, an activation from a ghoul. Um, but they're really good at sort of getting to a spot and then you know maybe reacting when they get hit there and then disengage and <laughs> try to run away next yeah. round. Well, and I'll say with that too, like in back to the the chaff loves fighting. Um, in a pinch, I think all chat like every dice that you can roll to try and take something out can work or can, mm -hmm. can be of value. Um, you know, uh, Arcanauts, you know, you and I have both, if, if they can plink enough, uh, you know, 
uh, damage here or there. It's yep. not a lot, but every every uh, hit counts, and especially with their uh, new you know their ability to shoot into melee now, uh, it's mm -hmm. great to have that extra stuff coming in. Um, you know, the same with you know dwarves or other things where. I mean, even back in my Untamed Beast days, uh, my Plains Runners, I had a Plains Runner named, uh, got a name of Ghost Killer because <laughs> she took down multiple leaders um, because I, you know, that's what was, there was nothing better for them to do than to just run into a, a mm -hmm. hero and take a, take a swing of three dice and see what happened. And, uh, you know, uh, legends are made uh, <laughs> uh, with with chaff that can um, kind of just dare. And what I like about that too is that, again, you're forcing your opponent then to either just waste a bunch of uh, waste an attack on chaff, or force them to do a disengage or something mm -hmm. inefficient. So, you know, chaff into big things uh, is a fun matchup. I think. I agree, and one of the cool things about it. So, like, if you think of a chaff cloud as a threat. Sometimes it can be a little bit less scary because it chaff brackets down as you kill them, whereas, you know, these big threats, they don't bracket down until you actually get them off the board. But the thing that chaff does let you do, which is cool, is, like you said, let's, let's see, let's throw some dice at you. If I get all whiffs, I know not to necessarily throw more good money after bad here, and I can use my chaff to do other things. But if I roll two sixes all of a sudden your hero's on notice and now running a bunch of chaff in is actually really incredibly effective because now even when you try to clear them i can counter you better not roll ones or twos because if you do <laughs> like you're falling mm -hmm. off the board quick um and so yeah. you get a lot of optionality there and so um using chaff yeah. bravely absolutely i agree is like um something that can be really really solid as a as a choice um, and you know going back to objective play often you know in objective play when that you come down to that last uh objective that needs to be contested you know mm -hmm. chat don't be afraid to to uh, roll the dice uh certainly you need to preserve so maybe let them come to you um mm -hmm. uh force force them to uh make a move and attack uh against you but um don't be afraid to be to, to roll those dice and take the chance. Yeah, chaff should play hard to get, but but once they do get you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, you know they should they should fight tooth and claw once they once they do get in there. Um, yeah, and I think and I don't know if there's another place to put that, um, but in that same way of gumming up what your opponent wants to do, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, you may turn something in to force them to attack a certain thing, but. If they're coming after you, if they're trying to, uh, something's trying to get to you, they've prioritized you as a target or a certain fighter. Mm -hmm. um, do not be the first one to to get into the that combat. Let them waste an action uh, moving. Yeah, and that kind of gets into sequencing, which was the next thing I wanted to talk about. Um, nice. Because... Absolutely. One of the cool things that is sort of a core mechanic of this game is exactly what you were talking about, which is that the person acting second can often have the advantage as long as the person acting first doesn't do something like overwhelmingly powerful. And so there's a really interesting sort of proactivity trade-off where if you, if you just kind of mosey on over you can end up wasting a lot of your own activations um and so i find i often want to have sort of a mix of uh i i heard this off like an aos list building bit of advice from um i think it was a podcast called Stormkeep, but they were talking about how aos lists want to have um efficiency and impact and those two things might not have might not be the same, but you want to have both of them. And so often your chaff are the most points efficient fighters in your warband, um, but you also want to have some really high impact stuff. And if you use your strongest thing that your warband does right away, that can often be a huge waste because then, you know, you're essentially giving these movement actions to your opponent who now gets to attack twice sometimes. 
But it can be really powerful to do right away if it constrains your opponent's resources by just removing their fighters before they've done anything. Um, yeah. Whereas sort of the other option is to kind of wait as long as possible to sort of find out your opponent's strategy. But um, going halfway, I find, is often poor, right? And so yeah. um, okay. I kind of, I encourage people like, and there's a lot of these things that I kind of want to bring out in this video, but um, I kind of want to sort of get the right questions in people's mind because in a, you know, this picture here of iron golems versus um, order of a, like some witch hunters essentially uh, is a really difficult sequencing problem. And sometimes when you are in one of these, you might not find the right answer in the time limit that you have to like get your game played in the in an acceptable time frame but yeah. if you get the wrong answer to the right questions i think you'll be more successful than if you just kind of make moves that aren't even on the correct axis this is where especially starting out it can maybe be more helpful to talk about it afterwards mm. um, mm -hmm. rather than worry about it beforehand uh because it it can be hard to know especially if you don't have a lot of experience, what that best move is going to be. And you're yeah. going to have a gut reaction to what that might be. Uh, and, you know, I had, I had, um, I find that treasure missions often flip the table on this, mm -hmm. where often with objective, like you said, you're, I think you're more in the wait and see. You're trying, I'm, I'm more likely to use the wait action with mm -hmm. the chaff uh, to force my opponent to make a decision that I can more easily counter or balance, yeah. uh, as opposed to showing my hand first so that they can counter it. With treasure missions, often, um, you know, that you're trying to get there faster. You're trying to make an impact uh, as part of the first part of your sequence uh, in your battle round. Mm -hmm. I want to. Uh, take somebody out. I want to take the. I want to knock the treasure out of their hand so that I can pick it up, or you know that sort of thing. And so it front loads a little bit. Um, and you know, you know, a couple of of our medicine um, uh, players, specifically Joe and Mike, like those two when they play, will sit on a scenario like on the screen and they will think through mm -hmm. what happens if I go here. What if I go here? What's the percentages there? What's the percentages there? And they enjoy that. They, they love that a lot. Mm -hmm. I tend to be a little bit more gut, a little more like uh, what I guess I probably rely on my experience and repetition to inform, hey, I'm going to uh, take out, uh, if I can uh, take out activations first, mm -hmm. right? Their op my opponent's activations, maybe that's the better move for me. So where's my surefire taking pieces off the board um, uh, place? It might risk this thing over there, this thing over there, but maybe I'll go that way. So I think it can be helpful if you feel like you're overthinking it, take, go with your gut and then talk through it afterwards so that you sort of like internalize what the right answer could have been mm -hmm. um, or what a different outcome could have been so that next time you play, maybe your gut's just a little more informed. Yeah, I think sense. that's really good advice on almost every strategy game um <laughs> like figuring well, the, the out the nice thing is that mm -hmm. you can play so many uh games of this if you move quickly right you can yeah. get repetition in easily at this game mm -hmm. um and so uh, uh maybe back to worry less about winning it and and more about what did i learn uh from this exchange or from this sequence yeah understanding why you lost is one of the most powerful things you can do and also a lot of people when they win just kind of tell themselves well it was preordained essentially like i won because i deserved to win essentially is is a lie that i think a lot of people tell themselves because it's fun and you know why analyze your wins but actually going back in your wins and looking at trying to figure out where you could have lost if things had gone differently can also be a really good um, exercise to do to, you know, stop yourself from yeah. being complacent. Um, one quick heuristic I did want to get 
um, across with uh, sequencing because this threw me for, a, this was like the main thing I think that I got wrong in the first few months of second edition coming from first edition. And I think it's something that okay. a lot of new players get wrong too, um, is how the value of your sort of the, again, the style of your chaff, uh, your cheapest fighters dictates how you want to sequence your turns. Um, and it's based on how good your reaction is. So for example, uh, I wanted to bring four examples here that are among the best cheap fighters in the game. Uh, Shatterers, sure. Arcanauts, Ironbreakers, and Mortec Guard are all just some of the best fighters that are out there. Um, and these four just play completely differently despite all being, you know, similar points cost, similar wounds numbers, um, because Shatterers and Arcanauts have garbage reactions. Um, they can't do anything. Uh, <laughs> Shatterers literally don't have a reaction, so they only have counter, but they don't have a lot of toughness, so counter's not very good with them. And uh, Arcanauts, their reaction is like this awful crap that you can only use when you're being shot at, um, but, you know, you're the KO player, like... You are the one who knows. I don't think it's. <laughs> I think it's counter plus if you're shot at, like melee or ranged. So it, I think it just says if one of your weapons can reach them, then you yeah. can counter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, but you're right. Like it's it's just a little bit better than counter. Mm -hmm. And they have T three, um, so they're not very mm -hmm. good at doing that. Right. I think right. some of the other stuff in KO is maybe a little better at doing it, but then costs a lot. So there's that trade off. But. Um, the reason I bring them up is because so because they don't get a lot out of reacting, um, a lot of the time I find that I want to sequence them early because if I don't get value from them, uh, for example, this uh, person with the Witch Hunter Warband, they were actually proxying these, uh, these spearmen were Shatterers, and uh, this guy with the torch is a um, – is the – the leader of Horns of Hushut, who's also got kind of two weapons that he's doing. It was actually a really clever counts as because everything is holding the same weapons that its um, counterpart in Horns of Hushut would be holding. Uh, but these two spearmen are acting as shatterers. And that uh, that Ogre Breacher is going to smush the shatterer that's within one inch of it. Um, there's like a... <laughs> I can't imagine a situation where it gets attacked by that breacher and doesn't die. So right. I would feel a decent amount of pressure to attack. I think that shatterer from where it is, is allowed to attack either the legionary or the breacher. Um, I would feel a lot of pressure to attack with that shatterer early um, in the round yeah. because yep. uh, your reaction is terrible. So what else are you doing? Right. Um, Whereas Iron Breakers and Mortec Guard are completely different. Uh, Mortec Guard really want you to use your high value pieces first um, because they love sitting back and countering. Um, Iron Breakers really want to have actions left when they die because I don't know if you've checked out the new Cities of Sigmar Dwarf rules, but. Iron Breakers get to give a free action to your big scary elites anywhere on the board if they die while they're still holding actions. And so that warband is really incentived to um, use its high value pieces first and then not worry that you're not going to be able to sort of have them to react to your opponent's strategy because your opponent better not kill any Iron Breakers or else you are going to just get more actions off of your high value stuff. Um, that's a great trade-in yeah it's incredible it's so powerful um, I've been playing against a local buddy with them and uh, I've been really impressed with what they can do when they're paired with like a Charybdis or um, mm -hmm. or like just like the really big Stormcast heroes or yeah. um, this player doesn't have an Achillean King but I just think it would go incredible with an Achillean King or like a big turn off hunt master or something like that either way that's a <laughs> that's a separate tangent but um yeah just 
think about if you're kind of new to your war band, if it's the first time you've played with them, um, actually read your reaction and maybe think about that as dictating how you approach your war band because um, knowing whether or not your cheapest fighters want to go first or last is I think a really good way to start honing in on how to pilot your warband correctly. And I think kind of a little bit target, this is a little bit target priority and sequencing in that, in that if you have opportunity to take fighters off the table and reduce your opponent's activations, mm -hmm. typically it's a really good uh, use of your uh, action economy, like in, in your sequencing. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you can, um, what's often a waste is if you're, have to end up attacking something that's already activated or taking out something that's already activated. So mm -hmm. to your point of like, I want to make this thing the most useful I can uh, often before it, you know, if it's on a few wounds and it's going to die this round, I want to potentially activate it uh, before it gets taken out. Um, uh, so being able mm -hmm. to remove the choice from your opponent of, of activations shrink their decision making box. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a really you know important target priority. Yeah, and then and messes with their sequencing. Absolutely, and you know reactions. <laughs> I didn't like them at first in two point but I've sort of realized how they do make the game more interesting because they do add another layer to that. Um, so that's kind yeah. of why I bring that up as sort of the the way to start thinking about sort of how you how you choose it. Um, yeah, and then we we've we've played with the idea. I don't think we've enacted it of because uh, I think reactions came out of uh, one of the white dwarf or one of the Toma champions like pit fighters uh, from one point mm -hmm. Yeah, but didn't they and call was, singles then? Yeah, yeah. And I um, we've we've played with that idea or discussed the idea of using that. Uh, uh, and I, I can't remember if we were thinking about it in addition to future actions mm -hmm. or as a limiter of how much you can react. Sure. If you could only use the singles that you have, um, would change the game quite a bit. Because there are certainly some that love or are reaction hungry. Um, yeah. They're better at reaction pieces than they are. Uh, I'm, you know, when I'm looking at Cities of Sigmar, the... Um, the Castellites have uh, an uber counter where uh, if you have an elite nearby and you react, then misses are two um, mm -hmm. uh, damage back. Um, all misses. So I, that's a pretty strong counter. Yeah. Um, how can I get that set up, right? Um, but it's, it's um, yeah, it's very interesting to, to think about so some fighters are better passive than they are uh, active. So yeah. that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it's it's definitely a thing to think about like the first time you pick up a new warband. And, and, you know, some fighters kind of are stuck in the middle, which is interesting. Like one of the thing, yeah. reasons I've always liked playing Plague Bearers is they've got toughness four. So against some fighters, they're pretty good at countering, but against others, they can't do it at all. But they their bespoke yeah. reaction is impossible to wound which like reduces incoming damage so now you have that option but neither of those are amazing but luckily their attack is pretty good for such a cheap fighter so then you've kind of got the three options to think about with every kind of decision point which is kind of a nice bit of flexibility and a little bit more um subtlety and play than i think people would look at these little you know 50 point duders and and think about but um, I I also I think often when I'm first teaching games reactions mm -hmm. I I don't add reactions in right away. Um, I think that makes sense. Often there's yeah. there's just there's a lot of things going on. You're thinking about your abilities, like trying to get abilities included is mm -hmm. can be tough in your first few games. Yeah, uh, and so often reactions are something I bring in 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 the third game or second game, third game or whatever. Um, it, it can just take some time to realize the value of them. Uh, and so if you're playing with some models in your first games without reactions, that va their value can change and shift as you add those things in. So now to kind of get to something completely different, 
I do find that this is one of the harder things to get right as you move from being newer into playing the game quite a bit. So there are some shortcuts that I think we can talk about to kind of simplify some of this for new players. Um, the, the picture, well, actually, let's start with just the simplest one, which is range. Um, there's a really interesting trade-off between, for example, if you are near an objective and you see a fighter of the opponents is already sitting on that objective. Um, you can assume, let's say, that they already moved, but you'll have to waste two move actions to get there. It's a really interesting question. Do I want to end the move tying up the fighter to be in combat next round? Or do I want to end the move sort of just outside of an inch so that I'm as close to it as I can be while making it waste an action to attack me? Um, and then, of course something that um, I think a lot of enfranchised players will maybe not realize needs to be explained, that I do find needs to be explained to new players, is the power of using two-inch reach to essentially remove actions from your opponent because you can put yourself in a place where you can attack them and where your opponent has to wait, waste an action to walk up to you to attack you back, um, which... Sort of is a really powerful thing you can do um, that I think most people don't pick up really the full value of it in their first two or three games. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things that it's important to do is ask the two questions with the range of the weapon, one inch, mm -hmm. two inch, three inch, 10 inches, 20, 20 inches, whatever, and movement. Um, because sometimes, uh, you know, by the Kelly and King, uh, I think is what, 10 inches of move and then I don't remember if it has two inch reach. So that means that 12 inches is its threat range, right? It yeah. can move 10 and attack two. So you think that if you just ask the movement range and you're thinking that it's a uh, you know melee one inch, then you're like, ooh, I'm staying 11 inches away. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> yeah. And then it, it can jump in and attack you and, mm -hmm. you know, depending on what, what model it is. So that, that range, uh, but also, you know, something has shooting, you know, know what it's, ask what its range is. So that communication, it, you know, your opponent will, should always be uh, forthright and, and willing to share any information on their cards so that you know sort of mm -hmm. uh, how far away things are. Um, and, and add those things up because something that can shoot might be able to, to hit you twice. Something that has a large movement and, and then a reach might be able to move and attack you. Uh, or if they've got uh, their slower, um, uh, less reach, then maybe you can stay out. They would have to move twice to get to you and then not be able to attack you. And But they want to be in combat next round uh, so they can you know hit you twice. Right. Um, maybe you can be outside of that range. So just knowing and asking um, and it's hard to keep all those numbers in your head and to like be sure mm -hmm. um, so but uh, ask again and again and, and you know don't be afraid of that and because again you can pre-measure in this game um, I have taken yep. to whenever I play against ogres uh, <laughs> I just lay down I have an AOS deep strike ruler uh, because all the important ogres have nine inch threat range uh, and so luckily these AOS rulers are all nine inches long. Uh, I just lay it down yeah. right in front of the ogre and I just play, I just play with it just laid down next to the ogre, yep, yep. <laughs> uh, because I always want to know, and I don't want to forget, right? If I take that, I just worry that if I take that ruler off the board, I will forget how far nine inches is and I will forget to measure yeah. with every single move. And think about, like, do I want to be within nine inches of this ogre? Am I okay if they choose this fighter as the thing to kill? Um, or do I want to, you know, keep my distance? Because a lot of these ogre players have two of these massive, you know, nine-inch murder bubbles. Um, and so you yeah. can't keep your whole warband outside of those nine-inch traps and, and win the game, right? You do... Um, Ogres are beatable, but you can only beat them by venturing inside the nine inch <laughs> death tornado. Um, at some, you have to venture inside it at some point in the game, but you need to be very sober about why you're doing it and when. Um, and uh, and so yeah, I just I just lay the ruler down so that I think about it with every single activation. Um, 
<laughs> I don't know if you do anything that kind of transparent and dorky, but I don't even care if my opponent knows my strategy with that. It's just like, <laughs> no. I don't. I, and I think it, it's helpful to, to let them know that you know, uh, you know, what their, what the range is and where you think the range is. Because, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's easy to get caught off guard. And, and to some extent, like, to that, that part, you know, like, if you ask me, uh, the range of something I will tell you, but if you don't ask me, I'm not going to necessarily give that to you unless, again, if it's a teaching game or if it's our first few games, maybe I'll yeah. be like, "Hey, but remember, I can still get you there." Uh, or if somebody, if somebody says, "I think I'm going to go here because then you can't get me," I may be like, "Well, actually, I think I can," because mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's again that next there like it. This will be similar. Um, uh, maybe we move to uh, the, the body blocking or line of sight blocking. Mm -hmm. uh, if, yep. you're, if you're trying to move a piece within the t with the intention of not being able to be shot at mm -hmm. with a ranged weapon, uh, I think it's really helpful to say, hey, I'm moving here. I think you can't see me. I'm going to move the, my model this way and be able to be like, okay, let me check and let ask yep. them to check and say, hey, am I blocking line of sight right now completely or mm -hmm. not? And get that out of the way as opposed to I moved there thinking that I was blocking line of sight and then the, it's their turn and they're like hey actually I can see you I'm going to shoot you now and you're like well I just wasted all that uh, <laughs> I, I wasted my positioning yeah um, so communicating what your intent is whether it's hey I, I'm am I or am I not within three inches of this objective am I uh, you know line of sight blocking Am I, if your threat range is 12 inches, am I 12.1 inches away, right? Like mm -hmm. making sure that you both agree, hey, that's where I'm at. Yeah. Um, and, and making it so that when it comes around to actually deciding on that, that you don't have to go to a dice roll or something because you were not in agreement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then another thing I wanted to get to was there's a lot of, fighters in the game that get to move your opponent's models around. And these are really cool. They're a lot of the most popular fighters for, um, I would say like there's like not for really new players, but for people who have played five or six games and are starting to get why being able to choose where you're going to go is really important. They see these abilities um, and I think these abilities are really hard to use correctly. And I just, as a, as an example, um, every time I've played against someone, unfortunately, who has one of these fighters, like a Slaughter Priest or a Great Bray Shaman or a uh, First Fang from Untamed Beasts, um, there's a few more. Man, every yeah. time, so netters are a different thing. I can talk about those later, but the pull abilities, every time I've played someone who had those, I ended up winning, and it was always because my opponent pulled something they shouldn't have. Uh, so you just <laughs> yeah, have yeah. to be careful. Uh, so this picture yeah. is my opponent's Slaughter Priest uh, pulling a Dark Oath War Queen and uh, not winning that fight. Um, <laughs> and I've had someone pull my... Um, you know, Stormcast, Evocator Prime on Dracoline with their Grey Bray Shaman uh, and yeah. not win that fight. And so it can be really dangerous. Um, so I think, you know, yep. these abilities are incredibly powerful. You can do things like some missions have little, if a fighter ends four inches from the battlefield edge, they die, uh, little tags mm -hmm. on them. You can pull someone into that kill zone. You can pull yeah. someone off an objective. You can do all kinds of really powerful things, um, but be really careful about pulling someone in a way that actually is just giving them a movement action uh, because right. it's, it's really easy to do that. Um, I don't know. Have you ever, have you ever seen have, someone kind of play too fast and loose with those pull abilities? Um, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, often they are um, one, they're, they're expensive and yeah. you, sometimes you're just got an itchy trigger trigger finger and you want <laughs> yeah. to be able to use it yeah right uh, -huh. uh and um you know you're you think you're being clever i love 
I love the the design space of being able to move other people's models. I think it's it's sort of like uh, fall, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you attack somebody on a platform and they have to roll the fall, like it's fantastic to be able to affect where they end up, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but also that they were they wanted to be on that platform and now you took that away from them. And we've um, we've again another one of those homebrew toyed around with the idea of a push mechanic like fall only where you could like bump somebody an inch mm -hmm. um, or something like that. Um, uh, so absolutely. And, and one of my most famous with my first Fang, uh, with my Untamed Beast, uh, famously in, in 1.0, I had a convergence that I, I think I played through four times before I, I, I uh, was victorious. And it was a convergence where I had to pick a board corner uh, quad quadrant mm -hmm. and at the end of the battle it had to be void of all enemy fighters and uh i played through it a bunch of times and kept like accidentally either giving away which quarter it was or just uh you know dumb luck uh they spread out into all the quarters and finally uh the first fang was uh, in the right position like i had to like pre-measure and and work with my my uh opponent to say am i really in range here but it was like mm -hmm. by the skin of his teeth was in range to yank a goblin um uh off of a quadrant and into uh, uh the opposite quadrant um to win the game and it you know it's it's a fantastic ability but it can be um i had to save that one i had to to make him not remember that i had it because mm -hmm. if I'm using it every round, then it's then they can be very avoidant of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, because it is a powerful thing. And then uh, I had to save that for my last action. Uh, I had to win activation uh, advantage and save it for the very last move of the entire game. So uh, it's a powerful thing, but yeah, you have to be careful with when and and who you use that against. Yeah, and then the sort of the flip side of that is um, instead of moving your opponent's models, you can lock them in place uh, with nets, which are one of the few interactive abilities in the game that's actually powerful, um, which is an, mm. it's an interesting design choice, I think, to make. There are so many good netters in the game. Uh, and for people listening, a net is something where there's a lot of fighters in the game that can, um, if they're within a certain amount and all these abilities are worded slightly differently, some of them say three inches, some of them say six, some some of them say the value of the dice roll. Uh, but then you can roll a dice and on a um, three up, although there is one that is guaranteed, there is one that is on a two up, and there is one where... There's a more complicated dice roll where you're 88% chance to succeed, but it's <laughs> a really complicated roll. Um, but if you succeed, your opponent cannot make move actions or disengages usually as well for the rest of the game, which is um, really powerful uh, and sort of forces your opponent to think quite a bit about you know how you could net them. Um, but it's also a thing that's really interesting because you can't pin your entire strategy on it because it does fail a third of the time, um, which I think yeah. sort of creates some interesting play, it creates some really and, annoying play sometimes. But yeah, <laughs> what were you going to say? And they become targets. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes early on. Um, uh, would you, just kind of a, a talking aside, would you categorize um, the Wildercore dogs as nets? when they can take an uh, an action away that can reduce the number of actions in an activation. Yeah, and I think, um, I don't think I would, although it's really powerful, obviously. And then um, Hunters of Huanchi have an ability that does that too. Uh, I wouldn't categorize it as the same. I think it has slightly different play to it, but it is very powerful and it does... Um, really change how your opponent wants to be positioning in any given situation. Um, like, like against netters, I often find if I have a big thing that could get netted, um, I often want to end every round in combat um, so that 
you know, if they net me, I can attack something. Um, but that can be really tough if you think you're going to do that to the netter because then they just net you and run away. You know, they disengage, net you, and then move, um, something like that. So, you know, if you can end yep. in, if you can end a round in combat with the netter and something else, that can be a really powerful thing um, because then they can't necessarily do it unless they're willing to spend an inspiring presence which is quite a few dice that's they're using an entire whole full house to uh to net you um but yeah it definitely changes how you have to play which is interesting i would definitely say those yeah. warhounds change how you have to play too but i think it's maybe a little bit different dynamic no it's it's just interesting um that being able to dictate of the you know, what your opponent's able to do with their miniatures is um, fun, is exciting, uh, but it's a, there's a high curve to it sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the last bit of positioning is a really interesting dynamic that's really hard to do in Warcry, but um, essentially putting, using screening units. Like if anyone's coming from Age of Sigmar, uh, screening is like essentially the backbone of that game. Um, I would say, uh, like putting sort of low value targets in between your opponent and what they actually want to kill. And it's much harder to do in Warcry, but there are good reasons to do it. There's, um, there's a lot of aura abilities in this game that are you know, generally not the most powerful abilities in the game, but I find them the most fun abilities. Maybe most people probably disagree because they're not that powerful that maybe they're not fun, but I think they're really fun. Um, and then there's also a lot of fighters in the game that are just really fragile glass cannons. Um, you know, things like fanatics from gloom spike gets or, um, the zinch sort of disc riders, for example, that really don't want to be in combat with anyone, but also are really fighty. They just want to like run over, destroy something, end not in combat, then run over and destroy something. And you can put fighters in between, you know, so that they can't run up and just attack your really fragile high target fighters. Um, you've played a lot of KO. I assume that you know this as far as like your Aether Cannon play. Um, but a castle has to essentially break apart and reform every round because you have to activate your fighters one at a time and you probably have to go somewhere with them uh and so you really have to be careful with your sequencing um as far as like which bit of the castle you break first and um for that you really want to i think look at the terrain and look at your opponent's sort of ways in towards your squishy targets uh and try to do it in the way that constrains your opponent's routes uh, towards your squishy people um, while still moving your people around. Um, yeah, I did a I did that a lot with uh, Ironbreakers and Longbeards uh, with the hero, giving them that the potential of plus one toughness mm -hmm. um, with the Bulwark Rune Mark. And it, yeah, it is really hard because especially if you are if you're trying to use an aura ability, often trying to activate that hero uh, early in the round. Uh, mm -hmm. so that your models have the benefit of it uh, if they get attacked and whatnot. But if, um, you know, I'd often have a hero with three um, dwarves with them. And, and I, I did a lot of successful cast, you know, um, screening against um, corn lords on Juggernaut because uh, that was the only way I could defeat them uh, right. by castling up and countering, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and so... Uh, yeah, the, there's, I think the other way you do it is, or, you know, with your hero is give them a babysitter as, you know, formaroid babysitter. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, even though you're often, often trying to spread that power out across different, mm -hmm. um, battle groups. Sometimes the deterrent is, you know, I have a bigger fightier thing, uh, if you come near me. Yeah. Um, but the... yeah, yep. Screening. And in general, I tell people line of sight and path blocking is really uh, is a low percentage chance of being able to really close somebody off mm -hmm. from the route that they want to take or the thing they want to get to. Um, and so in terms of like um, 
trying, you know, definitely try to do it. Try and block line of sight. Try and, uh, you know, see if you can screen. But, um, you know, measure it out. Talk with your opponent. It's it's it, it is difficult. And so don't don't rely on saying, "Hey, I move these things here," and in your head you'll have screened to them, mm-hmm. and then your opponent goes to do their measuring, and they're like, "You're like crap. I thought I screened them, but." You know, you didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, War Cry terrain is not built the way Kill Team terrain is. It's very, yeah, there's yeah. very little line of sight blocking terrain. I kind of wish there was more, but um, but I wouldn't want it to be like Kill Team. Because one thing I like about War Cry terrain is you're meant to, once you're on the platforms, you're meant to have bridges to the other platforms. Once you're on, you know, when you're on the ground, you're meant to be able to get to the other places. I think kill team terrain is very like there are buildings that are not connected so you can't climb up into one and then walk over to the other one um and i think yeah. war cry needs you needs that mobility yeah. but um but it does mean that well, line of sight is really difficult yeah. yeah yeah and we have you know some of the the sets that came out like the palisades uh from blood hunt mm-hmm. um you know can block line of sight um, I often, I'm, I'm very, again, if you're on one of those plat- bamboo platforms and there's a hole mm-hmm. and you can see somebody else, it doesn't matter how small that hole is, you can stick a spear through it. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, same with, you know, season one terrain had those like windows with the grates in them. Yeah. And at first we were like, through. really, can I shoot through that or can I, you know, whatever? And the answer is yeah. Uh, and so just play it with the assumption that it is. You're less likely to be able to block line of sight. Don't mm-hmm. get hung up on try- on you know uh, how you should be able to block line of sight unless you can truly block it, fully block it, one hundred percent. I have a trouble where I, I put a lot of banners on things, uh, and so <laughs> often I we we might decide ahead of time. Hey, can you if, is the banner part of my model yeah. that you can see, or is, you know is it just cloth waving in the air? So. <laughs> I shot your banner so hard, your fighter was sad at their ruined <laughs> stitching and ran away. <laughs> 18 wounds to your banner, you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> you die of low self-esteem due to broken banner. <laughs> the banner was the only thing you had to live for. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I set up a little picture here of uh, deployment, because I think that deployment is one of kind of the, the backbones of positioning. Um because I think one, I think I think I see a lot of new players and even a lot of intermediate players um, just kind of default to always deploying as far forward on their deployment point as they can. Um, and I do think about yeah, half the yeah. <laughs> uh, I do think about like half to two thirds of the time that is correct, um, but I don't think it's always correct. And so I want people to. Uh, think about that a little bit Um, and then also kind of the sequencing that comes from the first piece of that so for example um, to use your your KO example right so like you have this really interesting sort of dynamic with KO where um, Arcanaut Admirals are really popular choices for leaders for KO so if you have say a a deployment group that's an Arcanaut Admiral and a little Caradron Overlords Arcanaut just like the little 50 point guys and then an aether cannon which is this terrifying 110 point um artillery piece that can just blow other 110 point models off the board in the very first turn if it's getting the buff from the leader um there's a really interesting dynamic where you probably want your arcanaut kind of up front so that if they come in if you can path block with it um that's really powerful um But you also have this thing where you kind of want to save your um, Admiral because if they just run something, they need to get sort of, they either need to get rid of your Aether Cannon or they need to close the distance with it right away. And one of the things that's really interesting with KO is those KO melee heroes are actually really, really good at fighting. so if they rush you, I've heard people say like, oh, you just counter KO by rushing them. That's not true at all. Um, that doesn't work one bit. Like if you think that that's how you beat KO, 
I hope you never have to play against KO. I, <laughs> um, my 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 win records with KO are always come if if I can keep them coming at me, um, you know, you know that I, I'm going to win because I can just hold back and use every activation to shoot shoot. Yeah, um, I feel like when you lose with KO, it's because they were able to score points and you could not kill them and score points at the same time. Um, yep. And and that's where KO get vulnerable. I think that if you're trying to rush them down, you're in a really terrible spot. But there's a really interesting sequencing thing where if you use your sort of huge buff with your leader, all of a sudden you don't have that security blanket anymore. Um, I don't know. How do you deploy yep. your... Because I think you play warbands with a leader, an Arcanaut, and an Aether Cannon as a deployment, right? Um, how do you tend to deploy uh, yeah, those? Yeah, I... I, uh, when I was playing KO, I was trying to put the, um, both, eighth, I was playing two Aether Cannons. Uh, one mm. guy in our league played with four the other, the other day, just for fun. Um, but I was, I was <laughs> Quote trying to put fun. them both. <laughs> yeah, I, I was trying to put them both in one, um, uh, one deployment so that they could, you know, I could do Fiber Profit one time and they'd all get the benefit of it. Mm -hmm. But what I did find was that that battle group was more susceptible to, uh, you know, having something big rush into it and take out the Aether Cannons, one sure. or both of them, uh, and, and plug them up and force them to do it, you know, have to disengage. Um, uh, so, ter you know, the Pterodon Rider was from Zach was, you know, good at coming over and dumbing them up. Um, but I'd always have... Uh, so later I'd split them up so that I'd have the option to fight for profit over here or fight for profit over there. Um, and at some point in the game, the two converged and I would have a benefit, but maybe not right from the, the get go. Mm -hmm. Um, and if it, if it was, I, I'm a bigger fan of the engine master, um, with engine harness than I am the Admiral cause he's got, a, uh, some other things if he needs to get in and fight, if he needs to be able to punch things, he's got. A little bit more ability to do that. Is that the uh, 140 so point he, one? The 140, yep. Yeah. So he's got a 3535 mm -hmm. five that can boost that to a 4635 yeah. on a double. Um, and, uh, uh, but then again, like, it, you know, you want to fight for profit. So I, I'd either, you know, I'd have him and I'd have the point with somebody else uh, or with another group. And um, and then I'd, I'd use the Mizzen Master as a, as a more mobile. Um, version of that so if i needed to get him over to you know to somewhere else to use fight for profit or just to go grab treasure or whatever um so yeah I, I would spread it out and and um so that i'd have that power in different groups in case one got demolished one mm -hmm. battle group got demolished i'd have the other one uh to to use so redundancy i guess yeah um no, but that's... i yeah i mean i think i think positioning your battle group like knowing where your opponent is going to be deploying which can be trickier if they have a round two or round three deployment mm -hmm. um because you're like oh you forget about where they're coming in and you might move something up um i have some fateful games uh where i forgot which board edge my opponent was deploying in and mm -hmm. moved my treasure car carrier right into their deployment zone and, and uh <laughs> not cool yeah not cool at all um and I think there's situations like, for example, if you ever play against Horns of Hashut, uh, you want to deploy your warband. If you have the option, which you won't always, but if you do have the option, you want to deploy in a star so that one flamethrower can't hit your whole deployment group and ideally can only hit one fighter at a time. Because I have seen a flamethrower level an entire deployment group in one roll. Um, wow. And so uh, don't let that happen to you. <laughs> um, so uh, you can deploy in a star. Some warbands can't do that because their bases are too darn big. Um, yep, yep. But chances are, if you have really big based fighters, you are maybe a little bit less uh, susceptible to being flamethrowered anyway. Uh, the things where yeah. the flamethrower really really can destroy an entire deployment group in one shot is uh, when there's lots of little eight wound fighters. When you have those, you can deploy them in a little star around your 
around your deployment and you yeah. can kind of survive that way and only lose one fighter to the flamethrower. Um, I feel, I feel like the mid-level fighters are the ones that I need to be more worried about how to deploy them because, mm -hmm. you know, you deploy one wrong and, and you can get one taking off and you're like, oh, there goes that ability that I could really use in the game later. And if you Whereas lose like that chaff, value, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Whereas chaff, right, if you deploy them too close to somebody else and they take out a chaff, not as big a deal. Uh, or the opposite, if you have a, a fighty thing, but you're not aggressive with it, Mm -hmm. uh, you're too protective of it and then but you're not then close enough to um, make use of it in time uh, I, the first time I first time I ever pulled out the fulmeroid crusher and put it on the table I was like why am I being so timid with this like mm -hmm. he's just not I'm not getting the value out of him because I'm not I'm not wading him right into you know a group I'm like oh wait no this guy can wade into a group and survive and be fine right um, so things like that where um but I think the mid level, and that's where like the the aether cannons and and you know mm -hmm. other uh, Grunstruck thunderers and um, you know other things where you're just like they they have high value, but they're not super survivable. You mm -hmm. need to, to make sure their deployment is thought out a little bit better than the rest. And it's something that puts a real cap on a lot of mid-sized fighters and their effectiveness i think in general in the game is for example mm -hmm. i've got some guys next to me i've got some uh Myrmidesh pain masters with their shields and then also these awesome twin souls which are so much cooler but at the end of the day these twin souls 120 points all these chaos warrior equivalents 120 points for 15 wounds on toughness four it's just so easy to lose them and not get any value from them um, that mm -hmm. it becomes just a massive constraint on how much you can even play them in the game, um, which, yeah, yeah. you know, GW could change with a points tweak here or there, but um, sort of with the current paradigm we're in, I think is a really, really tough place to be. Um, and then also, yeah. I think another reason to not deploy right at the front of your zone is if your opponent just has a bigger bully piece than what you have, or if your deployment group doesn't really have any giant things in it, um, deploying outside of their charge range is, I think, a really important thing to be able to do. And it's a really good thing to think about what your, you know, what your own threat range is and whether you can force them into a situation. So like in this picture here, this Boingrot Bounder, if you move eight inches and then do madcap destruction you know you can get an attack in on the um the pyrocaster that's all the way on the other side of the board if your madcap roll is good so it's really useful to put that right at the front because if you put it at the back you can't do that but then i've got this little snurk sour tongue here in the bottom left where if that pyrocaster shoots it once it could just die and it's 130 points um, and does an incredible amount of damage in melee, it can't wait to get onto those little Zangors, but it's going to need to wait because that Pyrocaster will just kill it if it's not behind that yep. tree. Um, and sometimes the mission objectives will dictate how you can do this. So sometimes you'll want to deploy kind of sideways a little bit because that's how you're going to run to the objectives. Um, you know, if you deploy all in a clump, you might not be able to do that. Um, Sometimes, you know, a lot of the time you want to put those chaff fighters up front because you don't mind if they get taken down. But if they end up body blocking one of your big things from getting through them to where it needs to go, that can be a real disaster. Um, yeah. So, yeah, a lot to think about there that I think is yeah. Interesting. I think the the short length, the deployment on the the long board edges, as you mm -hmm. said. Um, you know, that's 22 inches wide minus three inch radius from each deployment zone brings it down to 16 inches. You know, there's some things that, uh, you know, are, uh, have some, you know, on a rampage or, or, um, with some buffs or boosts for destruction or, you know, whatnot that they can, they can make that distance sometimes. So, yeah, you know, especially on that, that long edge, don't be too, don't, don't feel too safe. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, finally, uh, 
you wanted to, oh, and by the way, for those long edge deployments, know that you don't have to all deploy in a clump. I find that new players often get confused that they don't have to be in a clump on those long right, edge right. deployments. So um, know that you can kind of play very silly and your deployment group doesn't actually have to be a group on those. Yeah, you could be have one in the middle and one on each corner. Mm -hmm. um, um, so you'd been excited yeah. to talk about list building. Yeah, what was, what was the things you wanted to get to yeah. first with it? Yeah, well, I think one of the things with list buildings, uh, list building is it can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of choices, especially if you're playing with compendium. Um, but even if you're playing with a bespoke warband and you've got, you know, 10, uh, 10 abilities to, you know, to, to look through and figure out what you can use. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to know <clears throat> that when you're building that um, the, the complexity of your list or the, the variety that you bring in your list can change the complexity on the table. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe that's good for you if you know the know the warband really well, um, but there's ways to kind of I guess some shortcuts that I think are helpful when building a warband, especially when you're first starting off, to give yourself kind of the best gaming experience. Mm -hmm. um, so, for instance, uh, having a good amount of activations so that you can have you know uh, some leeway or some fudge room if you don't make the exact right move with, with something yeah. um, is really helpful. So I would say, you know, seven to eight models is a really good amount to start with. Um, uh, it's a really comfortable place to be when it comes to having some activations. Um, and so if you can reach that, not all war bands are, are able to do that. Um, uh, but uh, seven or eight, you know, seven models can be, fairly easy to reach even for some you know ogres um uh so just something to think about there from a shortcut standpoint mm -hmm. if you go too low you just don't have a ton of um you're going to finish moving and then your opponents are going to have some other things that they can do without repercussion they get free range. Yep. they can free reign to punch you free reign to move on to an objective or grab a treasure or whatever mm -hmm. and you can't do anything about it um too many and you're going to take a lot of time because this is unfamiliar. You're going to spend a lot of time doing analysis, paralysis, that sort of thing. Um, and also so too I many, like, there are some types, sorry to jump in, but oh, yeah, there no. are also certain situations where if you have too many, you might not have a high impact piece that can sort of interrupt yeah. your opponent's plans, right? If, if every single piece of progress you make in the game is done in a tiny increment, Sometimes you don't have anything that can actually disrupt what your opponent is doing. Um, There's always things to jump into because I think sure. that leads into, uh, uh, you know, how you're going to build it. Um, I like, you know, I, you know, I find that when I have a list that has, um, I, you want to have something that wants to fight. Mm -hmm. You want to have something that wants to move, and I think you got you want something that wants to hold back or turtle um, yeah if you not, not every war band has all those things but i think if you if i, I don't think i've played a war band that doesn't have something no i have played war bands that don't have enough punch um mm -hmm. and it's really hard to to come up with something you know against something that can punch uh really mm -hmm. hard um and so um you know having something that can fight to go in and, and and rumble with with your opponent is really good um Movement, I think experiencing what it is to have a move six versus a move eight or a move ten, um, you know, move six is a really freeing uh, move speed. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't take a lot to feel like you're flying across the board or getting where you want to get. Um, yeah. So ten, 10 might seem appealing, but you pay for that, right? The cost of those models is high. Yeah. So six to eight inches is a really good movement. Um, it was one of my favorite things about the Untamed Beasts was they had quite a few things that were, you know, move five, uh, mm -hmm. uh, move four, move five, move six, um, and it was it was it was really nice. It was it felt like I could be where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I, I I love working with chaff that you don't care if it lives or dies. Um, mm. So I love that about planes runners. I love that fine about Arcanauts. Um, yeah. You know, like they, they have, if they can do something great, but if they can't, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Because um, back to that activation, if 
if I have seven and I can do a weight action with one or two of those, yeah. now I've got nine activations, right? Mm -hmm. um, I can stretch that a little bit. And I, I don't care that that model is only going to get to make one action that turn mm -hmm. or one, you know, like a move or a shoot or something like that. So like throw away, let some things be throw away. Don't make everything precious. Um, and, and I think those are, those are sort of, that's how I like to play. Um, having yeah. something that I want to, to throw forward and punch things, something that can move around and be evasive. Uh, and then things where, you know, it's okay if it dies, it's, I'm not going to get, um, fussed about it. And I think that when you're first starting, it just gives you that, it gives you, uh, when I talked about complexity of things, it gives you some variation without being overwhelming and just gives you a sense of what you like to play with in the future. Um, yeah. uh, and so that's, that's one aspect of, of list building that I think can be important. Um, to, to think about when you're selecting stuff from your warband options. One of the um, things, if you listen ever to the Dayton Warcry Club, one of the things that they um, have talked about a few times as being a really good piece of advice for new players is if you just have three things that can fight and the rest of your warband is just made of the cheapest thing in your faction, um, you'll do, a, like, you won't ever just be completely out of it. Um, or you won't ever just like lose upon deployment. Um, and so that can be a really nice thing for new players because, you know, for a more advanced player, losing uh, on the first activation of round one maybe won't hurt as much because like if you're doing it, you probably did it because you made a calculated risk that didn't pull up, pay off. But if you're new and you lose, you know, <laughs> before the game starts, it probably isn't because you sort of yeah. like put yourself in a situation to allow it to happen. Uh, and so uh, one of the best ways to make sure you don't lose before the game starts is just to um, have those kinds yeah. of three threats plus chaff. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I think, not... and I think a lot of war bands, not a mm -hmm. ton, like, but a lot of war bands have that uh, ability. And that doesn't mean mm -hmm. that they all have to be like 300 point beaters. Right. Um, but you know, a couple hundred and ninety, two hundred point um, guys who you know, if you come at them and then they get two swings at you, it's going to hurt. Yeah. And then you know, not every like when you look at lists, winning lists from various events, most of the lists don't sort of follow that paradigm, but some of them do, and I think it's just a really good way for new players to kind of build a list without having to necessarily stress too much about it and i do find that yeah. sometimes when i see new players um bring sort of especially since i make these videos i see people sometimes bring lists that i say are good in my videos um mm. and i see sometimes people sort of set them up wrong um in a way that makes them not be good because some of some really <laughs> powerful lists are actually kind of difficult to execute um whereas yeah. something that is pretty easy to execute is just like two big scary things one medium thing and a bunch of small things and that's always going to be easy to execute um so things like for example synergy pieces need to be in the same deployment group unless they don't because you're not that worried about it and you really want to only pull off this synergy late in the game and like these are actually really difficult things to figure out as a new player right um uh but but with those more simple list building plans i think they can work really well um i also well, and oh, i think yeah. that's that's a good point too in terms of like a, or could be really good for building is like treat you know sometimes you're thinking about the 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 list as a whole and like, what does this list all do? But I think it can be helpful to build battle groups first mm -hmm. um, because you can say, okay, well, what does this battle group do? Mm -hmm. um, I happen to bring, uh, you know, to your event, I brought the Charybdis and seven, uh, the, the pilot's name is Snow White, by the way. And then the seven dwarves <laughs> uh, because I was able to fit seven dwarves in the list. Yep. Um, but because of the monster, I could put more in each battle group which which gave me the ability to like create two castles almost right um mm -hmm. four in one group three in another um and uh but if i without that it was harder i had to spread them out more 
you know, I couldn't quite fit as many in, in, um, seemed like when I'd play it with other lists or other, or models. And so sometimes, um, you know, so for like, you know, fight for profit, I wanted, I tried to make fight for profit in each battle group. Um, and then I was like, well, what, what's benefiting from it in each battle group? Mm -hmm. Um, and so you create these, these little pockets of synergy and, what I what I, another thing I recommend for new players is that you know you might have ten abilities for your warband, but maybe you pick three or four that you want to focus on, yeah. and uh, you know each battle group get has one key ability that helps it out. You know what's tough about KO is that fight for profits pretty stand out, mm-hmm. so you kind of each battle group sort of formed around it, um, uh, and uh, you know so unfortunate that there isn't as much variety played there but other war bands so like um you know cities of sigmar i'd often have one group that was focused on being really tough mm-hmm. and having a lot of you know uh, toughness and then another group that they were all and i'm doing this with my uh, death right now is that they're all everything that's high movement is in one group because they're going to move together and support each other uh, when they're moving around so think about the battle groups limit mm-hmm. not don't try and include all the abilities possible from your warband pick two or three that you want to focus on and try them out build war, build your battle groups around that and that dovetails i'm so glad because that dovetails so well into the last thing i want to talk about which is kind of how to read a tournament pack because mm. a new player probably isn't going to be going to a tournament but the thing of getting from new to maybe a little bit more um, advanced and confident with the game is sort of feeling that confidence to be able to go and play people um, in kind of a public setting where you are tracking wins. And one of the things that I think is really hard uh, for newer players is deciding what should go in which battle group and which, even maybe once you've separated into three battle groups, uh, which battle group should have which name. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the really quick, um, sort of easy, really quick guidelines is, is there one group where when you look at the missions you're going to be playing, is there one group that is on the field more often in round one than the others? Then you probably want to, um, lean towards that one. But if there is sort of similar amounts, um, you probably want to think about what types of missions each ones are in. So for example, let's say your shield is on round one and an objective mission and not on round one a bunch of other times. You might want to just put a bunch of fighters in your shield, but not necessarily your most impactful fighters, um, because that way you can bring a lot of numbers and count on the objectives, but then you can save your more impactful fighters for those other missions where they might be on round one and they need to get fighting right away. Um, something like that. I don't know. Do you have any kind of tips for how to read a pack? Yeah. Um, it's interesting because when I play league and casual, right, you're sort of, um, you draw some cards and you're like, all right, let's see what we do. And you don't have a lot of through what your game plan is. So you're sort of reactionary. You're like, all right, what right. am I going to do first turn? We'll see what happens. With a pack, um, I <laughs> actually spent... I don't know if it's a lot of time, but I spend time on each um, pack formulating what my first, like if I have three battle groups, once I figure out what my battle groups are going to be, mm-hmm. I'm like, well, what's this one going to do? What direction are they heading? And so for instance, uh, one <laughs> on that, on that, uh, um, the, the mission where I had to go and grab treasure and quick bring it back, like there's three treasures and I could, take my missing yeah. master go and grab the far one and and really mess up my opponent on my on my uh player pack i had drawn okay they're going to move to here and then they're going to move over here because that's back towards my deployments yeah and i didn't read it i didn't w- look at it while i was playing the game and i went the opposite direction <laughs> um yeah but I try to, to go through the pack and be like all right here's their turn one mm-hmm. uh maybe here's turn two and, and what I try and do is I come up with my strategy or my game plan and I'm not so that when I show up, I'm not as worried about theirs. Mm-hmm. Um, 
or I can be like, all right, this is what I'm going to try and do. What do they have to, to stop that? If they're thinking about it, if they see yeah. it coming, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So I do a little drawing on it. I do a little kind of mapping out where I want to be and where I want to go and, and what mm-hmm. that, what I think that's going to accomplish. Yeah. That's really helpful. Thanks for talking through all this with me. Um, we've, uh, we've gone nice. long, which is ideal, you know, <laughs> <laughs> You did invite uh, someone from the Mortal Realms Network. We're nothing if not uh, winded. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's how it should be. Um, listen, if they're if they're new, maybe that means they've got plenty of time to uh, to listen. <laughs> Hopefully, um, no. This was a really good conversation. I'm really glad you came on. Thanks so much for uh, for talking with me. Um, hopefully, well, thanks for inviting me and. Yeah. And thanks for anytime. for all the content and the events you put on for the community. Mm, you're welcome. Um, so if anyone else, you know, has any questions about sort of tactical questions they uh, that we didn't answer on this or didn't get to, um, this is the video to you know comment about your weird convoluted question about what should I do in this situation? Um, This is the one. So uh, let me know in the comments if you've ever had kind of a tactical conundrum that you weren't sure how to uh, solve. And I can't wait to get to it. Um, So uh, I'll be hopefully answering those and um, getting to more videos in the future. And until then, may all your roles be crits.